Welcome to Basic Black at the Boston Public Library. I'm Donna Latson Gittens, your moderator. Our topic today is burnout. July is BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month, and we'd like to discuss how extreme or chronic fatigue and burnout are affecting communities of color, in particular black women and millennials. Our guest today, Dr. Cecil R. Webster, Jr., an adult, adolescent, and child psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and Celeste Vasir, a therapist, mental health advocate, author, and podcaster, also known as Celeste the Therapist. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. So why don't we just start out by getting a definition of what burnout is, and I'll start with you, Dr. Webster. Yeah, well, there's many different definitions for burnout, but oftentimes people experiencing, uh, will experience things such as feeling helpless or feeling like they are losing purpose or they feel a little less joy in the things that they're doing. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we started, but also those feelings of being overwhelmed or uh, feeling like you, know, you have some um, limit in your degree of flexibility and creativity and your day-to-day -day life. Well, Celeste, how, how have you seen that um, in your practice, talking to young people and black women? How are they talking about burnout? Uh, physical manifestations. I think uh, a lot of times we talk about the emotions around what we're feeling, but a lot of people are actually feeling stiffness and uh, back pains, and even some uh, medical conditions can come from um, the feelings of burnout. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, people have a hard time defining it at times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, once we go through the day to day, helping them understand what's possibly going on. Mm -hmm. And why is burnout so big right now? Obviously, COVID-19, we have, I know you all were chatting about that, COVID-19, the added pressures of um, the rise in, in uh, supremacy, white supremacy, those kinds of things. Talk about what you're hearing from people when they talk about how burnout is affecting them. Yeah. Uh, I'll start. Uh, you know, like you said, COVID-19, uh, and also, when the pandemic happened, we had to take on multiple roles in one setting. Mm -hmm. uh, single parents um, in the home, dealing with kids in school. A lot of stuff is still on Zoom. You're not going into work. Sometimes that commute, even though it could be lengthy, could be a time to unwind a little bit, get your thoughts together. And what I'm finding is people are kind of rolling out of bed into work and trying to help create some separation around that. Uh, that's kind of what I'm, I've been seeing. Yeah. To echo some of that, um, people have a lot of difficulty with the instability in their lives. Um, how to predict um, what's going to happen with their childcare, how much things cost, or uh, like any of the variety of things that are happening on a national scale, for example. Uh, but also, you know, you, you've, you've got a lot of that, but there's a lot less capacity for people to deal with all of this uh, um, need for flexibility, and it, it can really drain us over time. Well, and then it probably grows, or you experience it when you are in the office or you are at work. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got COVID, you've got the work pressures, you're trying to figure out how to work remotely. Um, how do you, what do you say to people when, they, when you're talking to them and on your podcast about how to deal with that kind of pressure? Yeah, so a balance is important, I think. Sometimes it's hard, but sometimes there's this long streamline of work, like your emails are still going off at mm -hmm. six and seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Prior to COVID, we, we left work and, we, and that was it. Now there's so many uh, tools for us to do work at home, and so we're not cutting off. Mm -hmm. And so I talk to people about the stability and about creating structure. Our, I think our mind operates really well off of structure. Uh, with the structure and creating space uh, for themselves because sometimes you forget you're human when you have so many responsibilities but I, I like to tell people if you weren't here people will figure it out mm -hmm. and so I try to empower them and encourage them to really like work on taking care of themselves first. Yeah. Well um, Dr. Webster can you talk a little bit about Millennials and you know they've been labeled the burnout generation um, and how they are talking about the job expectations how are they supposed to have buy a house um, they're saving money you know we've seen it with young people Simone Biles with the twisties and right. Naomi Osaka talking about her depression issues um, how, how do you reach out to young people to get them to deal and even think and talk about it? Yeah, well, I will say, fortunately, young people are a lot more accustomed to talking about their mental health and their mental well-being. Um, so they're, they're already starting off on a really good foot in that sense. 
Um, I will say that uh, the millennial generation um, especially has had a lot of economic hardships. Uh, there's been a lot of political instability. It's hard to afford to buy your first house. Hi housing costs are, um, uh, are rising. And there's a general sense within our economy that uh, people really need to work very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been guilty of that uh, many times, of course. I'm sure plenty of people here in the studio have as well. Right. Uh, but there's, there's a sense of your self-worth is tied to your productivity mm -hmm. in ways that I don't think was quite the case with all generations. And we are so available. Uh, Celeste was uh, talking about that difficulty between um, uh, the erosion of those boundaries between work and home. I think uh, it's just really graded on uh, young adults, especially uh, just navigating this new economy. Mm. I, just to turn it a little bit towards black women and the pressures that black women face. And you, you mentioned that just now, so us, we're all human. Well, black women have, there's a trope about black women being super strong that we yeah. can take on all kinds of issues. What do you say to women who call you on your podcast or talk to you in your practice mm -hmm. about how to get control of that mindset that we can't do it all? Yeah, and educating them about how it kind of started. A lot of times in our environments, mm -hmm. it wasn't that our parents sat down and talked with us and said, hey, like you have to be this strong black woman. I think we just seen it and then we learned how to uh, survive life that way, right? Because it's not living life when you are operating in that capacity. And so I think when people notice and understand how things start, they're able to like unwind a little bit and take off the layers and learn how to advocate for themselves. Because mm -hmm. not only do we take on the role, I think society looks at us that way as well and um, portrays that on us and we unfortunately take that on and so if we can understand just because the environment and people around us are, are, are that way maybe our friends or our caregivers it doesn't mean we have to be that way uh, and they find themselves having a lot more uh, peace and a lot they slow down a lot more when they're able to like really work on putting themselves first and dr. Webster what's your take on that yeah um, I will say many of the black women that are in my practice often express very similar thing. Like they'll enter into the office saying like, I'm really burnt out, I'm doing all of this work, I'm not really being recognized for the contributions I'm making in the office or in the clinic or wherever else that they might occupy. And then there's this real deep sense of like, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. I can operate at this level. I can operate at this level for a long time. They really embody that sense of, of I'm supposed to be superhuman. And um, as Les was saying, it, it, it can take a while to help people understand the origins of that and help them sort of unwind from the experiences of their environment having pressure on that, uh, from the internal pressure that they might feel um, to embody that sense of being a superhuman. Mm -hmm. Like we have to take care of ourselves um, right. and we can't just assume that we'll just be fine. And meanwhile, we're taking care of everybody else. So mm -hmm. it's yes. how do you find the time to do that? Uh, life is coming at all of us very fast. Um, and to that point, what about dealing with depression and talking about it within the family? That's been one of the biggest taboos. Nobody wants to talk about it, or at least the older generation. Um, you, you, as you said, Dr. Webster, young people are you know, taking hold of it and saying, yeah, I need some space. What are we saying to the older generation about how to talk about anxiety and depression? Yeah, I'd say it's a, it's a cultural challenge, mm -hmm. uh, not to uh, lump all older generations into one category, of course. Uh, but many times people just simply don't know what depression is. Like, well, I'm, I'm not depressed, but I am more irritable, and I'm not sleeping as well at night, mm -hmm. and I've lost 15 pounds, mm -hmm. and like, they don't realize that that constellation of symptoms might actually be depression versus simply being tired from a long day's work. So uh, there can be some very basic things that we can do in order just to let people know, like this thing that you're experiencing has a name. There's all sorts of research to support how we can uh, support your treatment for it. And it's also not your fault, but we can certainly work together in order to uh, figure out how to solve it best. Yeah. And, and Celeste, can you talk a little bit about access to help yeah. uh, and why it's so important that we have uh, people of color as psychotherapists and psychiatrists and. Um, why that's important for women and, and yeah. all of us of color. You know, I think it's hugely important and uh, access to uh, services has not always been available. Even having time to 
do these things has mm -hmm. not always been afforded to us. Uh, there's something powerful when you see people that look like you talking about these mm -hmm. things. A reason why, like Dr. Webster was saying around people not understanding is because on TV you don't see people still functioning and operating um, at a capacity that a lot of black people operate out of uh, because we're so used to surviving. Uh, and mm -hmm. so a lot of times um, just kind of recognizing and naming what's going on has been um, a really huge uh, help for people. Um, because if you don't have a name for what you're dealing with, I think you just feel like you're just struggling and start to feel really hopeless. Mm -hmm. And so having people of color and having people understand what you're going through, who may have grown up in the same areas as you and can bring that component into the uh, session is, is extremely helpful. Talk a little bit, um, uh, Dr. Webster, about the warning signs. Give us some tips about what we should look for and if we have a family member who is struggling. Right. So. I like to sort of divide it into burnout and depression. Burnout being sort of a lighter but no less significant experience that many people have, and depression being a really significant clinical diagnosis that we often need to have interventions for. So burnout might be things like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm doing my best at work, I'm like forgetting things, I don't feel as creative, I feel a little foggy. Mm -hmm. But uh, things like depression can be some of the things that we mentioned earlier, such as having like significant sleep changes, like you're sleeping a lot more, sleeping a lot less, feeling like hopeless or worthless, um, certainly having big changes in our like appetite or our weight or feeling really guilty or responsible for everything. Um, at the worst of it, or on the, um, on the other end of it, I should say, um, many people will start to have thoughts of like, you know, like it, it might be better if I weren't around, or maybe I should like end my life in worst cases. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a wide gamut of things that people experience, and everyone's a little, little different. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, some of those early warning signs might simply be, oh, that's weird, I'm not, I'm not sleeping as well this week, and that's unusual for me. And for others, it might be, I've got my eight-year-old, and I love them, but I was so irritated with them like, uh, over like, this thing about summer camp, and that's also not really like me. So one of the things that I often recommend people to really know is to know themselves, know their body, know their patterns in a really deep, intimate way that I think we often ignore. And um, if you can note some of those small changes, it can, build, it can be a lot easier to say, like, oh, okay, I, I think this is some of my early signs for depression, as an example. And uh, Celeste, when people call into your podcast, um, what, especially millennials, what are they saying right now? How are they dealing with it? Uh, they're naming it. Uh, millennials are okay with talking about things and being a little bit more vulnerable, I think. Uh, and talking about some like physical, a lot of times I'm bringing up the physical manifestations. Mm -hmm. I'm really big on like recognizing how your body's responding, but in order for you to know how your body's responding, like Dr. Webster said, gotta, you gotta know your body. And right. a lot of times when that back starts hurting, we just adjust and then we walk around like this instead <laughs> right. of saying like, what's going on? Right. Uh, and so a lot of times I'm bringing that and, uh, and people are recognizing the headaches, the migraines, the blood pressure elevating. And, and, um, and a lot of times when they say like, I can't, I can't find time I said well you, you'll never find it's not more than 24 hours you got to create time mm -hmm. and so I think just having that perspective shift and really beginning to become more intimate with yourself and how your system is responding um, has been a huge help for people can what can you both recommend um, that women black women Millennials black people in general do to make sure that they're doing healthy habits what types of habits should they should we all have to kind of mitigate the, the issues of anxiety and depression? Uh, so one of the things that I talk to everyone about is just your sleep, your the food intake, and moving your body. Those three things alone can really help our mood and our mental health. Uh, when the pandemic started, that was a huge thing that I, because I didn't even know what was going on, and I it was a huge, component of the things we can try to work on having control over. Mm -hmm. um, having grace with yourself because you are human. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times we could be hard on ourselves because like Dr. Webster said, we equate our value to our work and mm -hmm. it's not fair that we do that to ourselves. Um, so really having grace with yourself and building uh, different habits, whether it's uh, walking in the morning, waking up before the kids wake up to have some tea, or when you put them to bed, taking time to reflect and ask yourself, how are you feeling, what's happening? We're always on the go and we never like mm -hmm. take time to recognize how we're responding. And so it eventually catches up with us. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to catch it at its infancy and not when we're um, kind of like stuck in bed and not able to get out, you know. So that's some of my recommendations. 
You said it very well. I, I'm not sure I have much to add, with the exception of perhaps um, emphasizing slowing down. Mm. Um, we need to have unstructured time. We need time to, uh, as Celeste was saying, really be embodied, know what our body is like, know that we can slow our heart rates down and calm some of those, uh, all of those uh, surging hormones that we have when we're stressed. Um, and, you know, we, there is such cultural pressure to be so productive, and we're just not designed for that as human beings. So um, that idea of like giving ourselves grace for that, I think, is really quite critical. And the additional piece that I might also add is never worrying alone, um, mm -hmm. in a sense of like having connection with people. Like if you're worried about something, if you're stressed about something, or something's like just nagging you on your mind, that, that's a time to speak with other people about it, whether it be friends or colleagues or whomever else. Yeah. Just being connected is important. And you know, for, for future you know, millennia, or now we have the zero generation, for future young people, what, we should be teaching them about mindfulness, how to just be in the moment. We're so busy projecting forward. How do, how do you talk to people about that? Well, you know, I have a lot of adolescents and kids in my practice, and this is a perennial difficulty. Uh, but they are in a generation where everything is so immediate. They can order something, and it'll be like at their doorstep by the time they get home. Uh, they can like text their friends immediately and like uh, message them on Instagram. It's really about slowing them down and also helping them understand the boundaries between their school and home and time with their like stepdad, for example, like helping them have a little more division in their time and being able to be present wherever they are, mm -hmm. which is often not the case, unfortunately. Okay. And anything else to add? I would just say I, t I tell people that our country moves at a really high pace of mm. who's next, who's going to get what. And so, you know, it's, it's really hard because we operate in an environment that promotes just go, go, go. Never like, how are you feeling? Right. Mm -hmm. It's just like, what, what are you doing? Where are you at in life? Uh, people, when they meet you, what do you do for a living, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of what, who we are, unfortunately, we connect to what we do. And so when I, I explain that to people and say, but we don't have to operate at the pace of society, right? And in order to do that, being intentional about your day-to-day, -day, how you wake up, are you starting it with the news? Unless mm. you're watching me, because I talk about mental health, that's okay. But <laughs> are you starting it with the news, or are you uh, going on your phone, or are you creating a mindful moment for yourself? So that's important, I think, for people to understand, is that just because we are in an environment that promotes the go, 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 we can actually work on being intentional and reframing our mind into slowing down because that's where peace lies is in the moment yeah I, and I have one more question as it relates and you touched on it but the use of social media hmm. um, I am I have a millennial at home and well she's not at home but I have a millennial mm -hmm. and you know constantly on the phone won't pick up the phone will only text <laughs> it's the constant constant when do you say okay put it down and just breathe what do you what do you say say to them about that? Well, um, as a child psychiatrist, it's hard for me to tell like my child patients, like, put your phone down. <laughs> but what I will often say, uh, or I'll be curious about it, like, do you find that this has given you a lot of joy? Like, mm. do you feel more relaxed now that you've seen your, like, friends on Instagram on vacation without you? Is this, like, better that you're texting at 2.30 at night? Like, some of those questions are pretty leading, but, you know, that's a joy <laughs> of seeing, like, 13-year-olds, right? Um, but just helping them be more aware of how their actions are impacting, how they're thinking, how they're feeling, how they're moving about the world can be really tremendous. And we have a lot of research that shows that uh, social media can have a, some, some pretty negative impacts mm. on the mental health of adolescents and kids, particularly. And Celeste, what do you say to them? <laughs> uh, exactly what Dr. Webster is saying. A lot yeah. of times, and I only have adult clients, they'll say, um, I took a social a media break, I feel a lot more secure. I don't want to put a negative notion on social media because we use it, it depends on how we allow ourselves to use it. Yep. So I talk about creating screen time for, for themselves, curate in their feed. Uh, so if they're feeling insecure about something, stop watching people that creates that insecurity in them. Uh, and I just really empower them to use the control that they have. We have control, so it's not about blaming social media, it's looking at our actions and what are we choosing to do. Yeah. One of the things that I really, you know, wish we would all do is have more hobbies. It's almost like there are no hobbies anymore. You know, we watch sports, we watch TV, we stream everything, but what is the thing that you love? What, what are you passionate about? And how do we get that into our yeah. psyche? Yeah, that's a, ooh, that's a large cultural question. I think mm -hmm. much of America is really focused on our doing rather than like, our, like the things that we really enjoy. 
Um, so I often like, uh, like well, I'll say for myself personally, like I really just like getting my like hands dirty, and I like gardening. I like mm. to see like flowers bloom that I've like been able to plant. Um, and for somebody else, it'll be very different. Um, it, it might simply be like uh, spending time doing Wordle. It might be like whatever it might be, right? Uh, but you have to get people to slow down enough to actually look around and say, oh, actually, I do really enjoy this woodworking thing. Like I haven't done that since like uh, my granddad taught me. So. Well, that's awesome. Thank you both very Thank much. You. This has been very productive. Uh, we're out of time, but I appreciate the discussion. And I want to thank Dr. Cecil Webster and Celeste Vassier, the Celeste the Therapist, uh, for a great conversation. Be sure to catch this discussion on our social media platforms. And this has been Basic Black at the Boston Public Library. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Wait, when did you start your garden? What's that? When did you start your garden? I started when I was in February. Did oh, you? really? Yeah. Um.